the Digital Futures Institute at King's has as its raison d'etre the challenge of living well with technology. It's a simple, sunny and straightforward enough phrase, four words, living well with technology. None of them very obscure or enigmatic. But do we in fact know what they mean, or all the things they might mean? And what might it mean to take living well with technology as a project, a puzzle, or even a predicament? Well, I'd like here to answer this question by parsing out the phrase living well with technology, word by word. Parsing meaning simply the portioning out of different parts of speech in a phrase, distinguishing what they individually mean and how they work together. It's an exercise that's been undertaken in different ways and at different times by different kinds and conditions of person. Linguists, grammarians, code breakers, geneticists, teachers and preachers. When I asked my son why he wanted to carry on with Latin at A-level alongside chemistry, he said, Dad, Latin is just chemistry with words. The meaning of a word is its use in the language, wrote the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. By meaning, he meant not what a word stands for, but what it does. Not what it refers to, but what it means to say. Curiously enough, reading a sentence in this way is not unlike investigating the workings of a kind of machinery, in that it doesn't make much sense to ask what a machine is without reference to what it does and how it does it. By the time I've finished, I hope it might be clear that wondering what machines do and what we do with them is a large part of what it means to live with them, well or badly. So let me try to play through the senses of these four words, picking them out one by one like the notes in a scale, though as with Eric Morecambe's version of the Greek piano concerto, not necessarily in the right order. I'll start, in fact, at the end of the phrase with the word technology. We might say that technology just means machinery, except that we should notice straight away that where machinery has a singular in the word machine, technology does not, at least not in English. If we refer to a technology or the technology, as in we have the technology, we don't refer to a single instrument or contraption, but to a whole technological class or system of such things as in steam technology, or computing technology, or biotechnology. The Greek word logos, which provides the ology ending of words like technology or climatology, means simply word. But it also has the sense of the understanding, or as we say, the organizing logic that words can give. Our use of the word technology seems to retain the earliest meaning of the word in both Greek and Latin usages as the understanding or logic of a techne, a techne meaning a craft or artifice. In its early uses in English, the word technology could be used specifically to mean the jargon or technical language in which a particular art or craft was conducted or explicated. Indeed, the commonest area of application of the word technology in English well into the 18th century was as the systematic study of grammar, making technology a word for the knowledge of the art of using words themselves. Now, these usages are both exotically antique and yet, as so often seems to be the case in thinking about the history of the usage of words, uncannily familiar. Though users of words may forget about their origins, the words themselves never seem to entirely. For the most important thing about the contemporary word technology is that it never refers simply and neutrally to a set of machines or technical devices. It includes the idea that there may be some idea behind or working through technology. Technology does things for us, but technology also seems to mean something to us. 
in working out how to w live well with technology, we're trying to define the sort of promise that technology might seem to hold out for us, and the question that it might seem to put to us, what the philosopher Martin Heidegger called die Frage nach Technik, and the response that we are to make to both. The logic of technology is that of a promise, a promise of a transformation, a lifting of human being above and beyond its own existing capacities. In reflecting on what we are to make of technology, in other words, we must take account of what technology may make of us. More even than this, Logos points to a rather grand and metaphysical idea of the formative or engendering power that speaking a word may give. This is why the Gospel of St. John begins with the words in the original Greek, en arche en ho logos, in the beginning was the word. That is, at the beginning of all things, there was the inaugural open sesame, hey presto force of the word of God. For example, in uttering the words, assuming that they might have been uttered in Hebrew, as was indeed assumed for centuries, yehi or, let there be light. This theological association of the Logos with the magic power of fiat, let there be, is powerfully at work in the idea that technology doesn't merely consist of things to do things with, but itself is possessed of certain kinds of motive force that we would do well to try to understand. So Logos doesn't just mean a word, but also an idea. And not just an idea, but the idea of an inceptive force of making things happen. The French architect Henri Le Corbusier wrote in 1924 that a house is a machine for living in, although his French, machine à habiter, might equally well be translated as living machine, or machine for living with, just as Corbusier calls an armchair une machine à s'asseoir, a sitting down machine, and a typewriter a machine à écrire, a writing machine. It used to be thought that technologies were primarily labour-saving, so things to work with or to make work easier. Nowadays, so much of our social life is mediated through technology that we must feel constrained to say that technologies are not just what we work with, but what we work at living with. Now, living is something that living creatures cannot help but do cannot help seeking to prolong and to be candid, when it comes to it, can find it surprisingly hard to call a halt to. But living is also something that specifically human creatures cannot but contrive or strive to do in some way or other, to get a life, as we contemptuously say to someone who doesn't seem to have much of one, implies the obscure but pressing necessity of making something of your life, thereby avoiding what every culture of which we have knowledge seems to have regarded as the unthinkability of unstyled existence. That we should be unable to be without meaning to be is a curious thing when you think about it. This is not to say that it's impossible to imagine or to try to live out in practice such a wholly unmeant or unstyled existence, for literature and philosophy give us recognisable examples of it, in a figure like the Greek philosopher Diogenes, for instance, who was so determined to live a wholly natural life that he lived naked in a barrel in the middle of Corinth urinating and masturbating publicly, and what Corinthians of the 4th century BC regarded as really disgraceful, taking his meals shamelessly in the open. The philosophy exemplified by Diogenes, cynicism, from kuon, dog, means literally living a dog's life. But of course, Diogenes wasn't doing this on a whim or as determined by the throw of a dice every morning, but rather pursuing a program. His styleless existence, like that of any dissipated avant-gardist, 
was itself a style of existence, and one into which he had to put a great deal of work. One of the most difficult, indeed impossible, injunctions that any human can be asked to obey is to act naturally, to act as though you are not consciously acting or putting on any kind of act at all. Try it sometime. Typically, human beings have conceived their existence as a kind of task of styling, a project or mission rather than mere emission. Sometimes, as in Christian mythology of redemption, this has been seen as a work of salvation or penalty for some kind of inherited fault. It's not enough to live. We must, it seems, make a living or make something of ourselves. So this implies that living is already a kind of art, something that you can't just do, but have to work at doing, and so may require precisely the kinds of things signified in the Greek word techne, art, style, technique, mode, manner. One of the defining principles of human life is the fact that all humans pick up the rumour and eventually almost come to believe it, that they're not going to live forever. This finitude makes the way in which we live the time we have an urgent and unignorable matter. And technologies are bound up with this and the ways in which we bring our time under tension, like the rigging of a ship. Technologies allow us to complicate and diversify our time experiences, even as the succession of different technologies provide historical scansion and scaling, Iron Age, Bronze Age, Steam Age. Just as technologies like clocks and other kinds of timepiece measure time, they also allow us to stretch, concentrate and reiterate time. Only writing for example, makes it possible to declare truthfully, I am dead. Not surprisingly, one of the ways in which humans have sought to shape their lives is in order to have it said of them, as in Macbeth, Malcolm says of the Thane of Cawdor, nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. This process of preparing for leaving life was known for many years as the Ars Moriendi, or art of dying. Our styles of life and styles of death become us, as Shakespeare hints, not just in that they suit us or seem characteristic of us, but also become us in the sense that they turn into what we will have been, seeming to sum up the kind of life we have had and allowing us to live not just in the moment, but before and after our own living. Hence the fascination with famous last words. I agree with W. H. Auden, who thought the finest of final words were those of Lady Hester Stanhope, who died saying, it's all been most interesting. All living creatures have biology, but we are the only ones we know of who have biography, not to say autobiography, and since there's no autobiography without writing, and no writing without some form of technology or material mediation, stylus, keyboard, screen, living must always involve kinds of artifice, technique, or technology. If, that is, we are to work out ways of not just living, but living well. Like many simple and familiar words, well, is a wily word. I remember a game of adverbs played one Christmas in a Department of English reading retreat in Cumberland Lodge in Windsor Great Park. Adverbs is the version of charades in which a player is given actions to perform in the manner of some adverb or other, abruptly, gaily, languorously, surreptitiously, and so on, which the audience then has to guess. When it came to her turn to perform, Barbara Hardy, the head of department, duly mimed, as prompted, a large number of actions, ironing shirts, chopping carrots, writing a letter, drawing curtains, but all with no apparent qualities that would enable the particular fashion in which they were being done to be identified. We tried neutrally, 
plainly, ordinarily, economically, unreflectively, all without success. And eventually we were forced to give up, at which point Barbara smirkingly revealed that she'd just been performing the specified actions well. Why should wellness be so hard to recognise or characterise? In many of its uses, the word well has a conditional sense, implying the existence in different circumstances of clear criteria for the determination of what it means to perform well, as an investment might be said to perform well, or an employee or a team member. On the one hand, it's a positive signal of the good, the approvable, even the admirable or the excellent. The word commonwealth contains the Middle English word well, which meant the common good, the wealth of a community, wealth meaning literally wealth, wellness, just as health means health, wholeness. The term well-being appears in written English as early as 1561, when it's used in a translation of Castiglione's The Courtier, which writes of women that it is well enough declared how necessary they be, not only to our being, but also to our well-being. The 14th century English mystic Dame Julian of Norwich reported the promise made to her in a vision by Jesus that all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. But there is an oscillation in the long history of the word well in English. If doing things well implies admiration or approval, there is often something moot or muted in the word well. This may be because wellness is commonly defined not as a positive quality, but as the absence of woe or sickness. Historically, the word well in English suggests not just what is good, but what is proportionately good. On the whole, something that's done in an acceptable or satisfactory rather than a superlative manner, as though holding back from overdoing it. The whisper of precaution attaching to wellness is apparent in the somewhat archaic phrase, mother and baby both doing well, as well as in the all things considered watchfulness of a word like welfare and even in farewell. Somewhat oddly, the word wellness implying some positive or persisting condition of being well doesn't appear until the 1650s when it was new enough to be regarded as something of a novelty or puzzle. We have the proof of this from a letter of 1653 that one Dorothy Osborne wrote to her fiancé. I cannot excuse you that profess to be my friend and yet are content to let me live in such ignorance Write to me every week and yet never send me any of the new phrases of the town. Pray, what is meant by wellness and unwellness? The Oxford English Dictionary notes the appearance only in the 1950s of wellness as a positive rather than contrastive quality and quotes Halbert L. Dunn writing in 1959 of the fight for high-level wellness. Wellness of this kind seems like a survival or an energetic revival of the classical notion of the good life, entertained especially in the work of Aristotle, who writes, Now, it's thought to be the mark of a man of practical wisdom to be able to deliberate well about what is good and expedient for himself, not in some particular respect, i.e. about what sorts of things conduce to health or strength, but about what sorts of things conduce to the good life in general. Wellness may increasingly be understood not only as a personal ethic, but from the 1950s onwards, it seems, as a collective programme, the optimization of social life conceived increasingly as though it were itself an intricate kind of machinery, in need of continuous monitoring and maintenance. If this is to be the case, then living well with technology might mean expanding our ideas of what a machine is in quite significant ways. 
So living always implies trying to live well rather than poorly, even though it's not clear in advance how well is well enough, and as such is something that requires to be thought about and contrived rather than trusting to luck or providence, a contriving that may well need to make use of the kinds of contrivance that we call technology. To unpack the word with, we need to go back to the Gospel of St. John. En arche en ho logos, in the beginning was the word, he writes, kai ho logos en pros ton theon, kan kai theos en to logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. We pay a lot of attention to pronouns nowadays, but in truth, prepositions are even trickier customers. What is the nature of this with, of this pairing and proximity of logos and theos, of the word to the God who deploys it, or the coupling of human and technology? The pros of pros ton theon is there in a word like prosthesis, meaning an artificial attachment or replacement. In Greek, pros means both with and towards. Plato's Protagoras tells the story of Epimetheus, who is responsible for distributing among all the animals their distinctive powers and qualities, but who discovers when he comes to humans that he's used up all the available qualities on other animals. Epimetheus has a more celebrated brother, Prometheus, whose name means foresight, as opposed to Epimetheus, which means hindsight or afterthought. To compensate for the blunder of his brother, Prometheus steals the art of fire from Hephaestus and artistic wisdom from Athene. The phrase, living well with technology, seems to assume the temporal dimension of technology in its suggestion that there could be, because there once was, a way of living, whether well or ill, without technology. Well, such a view can be maintained only as long as the technology in question is taken to refer to particular forms of it, all of which we might well be able to imagine living without. But as soon as one begins to wonder about technology in its broadest forms, as they have been and still might be, and therefore about technology as such and in general, the condition of natural or wholly unaccommodated existence is much more difficult to conceive. The paradox is that technology is something extra, part of the prosthetic way in which humans form prospects and projects. And yet at the same time, technology is profoundly co-substantial with humans to the point of seeming indissociable from them. So that it's unclear in what sense a life lived without recourse to any kind of art, technique, or technology, most especially perhaps the technology of language, could qualify as human at all. Hence, like the Logos that St. John tells us is pros ton theon, with God, humans are paired with what they are for, in the sense of what they use to make good their Promethean foresight, their prospects for prognosis. Philosophers distinguish between things that are essential and things that are accessory. But we must say that humans are essentially accessorized, their being or what they are in themselves being formed through what technology allows them to become in their future selves. What humans essentially are is to be for something to be for what they are not yet, and so always to come before themselves. The technology of fire, of course, requires careful handling, and you may recall that though it turned out well for us, more or less, the theft of fire did not turn out at all well for Prometheus. For though technology is often designed to create ease and optimize pleasure, 
the relationship between humans and technology is also productive of risk, friction, and what we call alienation. If technology can transform us, it also has the power to deform us, to make us strangers to ourselves. In any case, it seems that living well with technology will imply not just the simple use of technology for the kinds of protection and fulfillment that technologies so obviously seem to offer, windmills, refrigerators, cars, televisions, cookers, computers, Geiger counters, burglar alarms, which might seem to imply that the more technology and the more different kinds of technology we have at our disposal, the better, but also something like the willed, reflective adjustment to what technology might have in mind, or at least in store for us. This perspective might allow us a rhyme between living with technology and a phrase like living with diabetes or some other condition that makes demands upon us. Seen in this way, living with technology would include the sense that technology can be somewhat difficult company. It seems as though the question of how we live with technology, though it can never be entirely separate from questions of technique, is equally not one that can simply be delegated to technical systems. Technology is instrumental in the sense that it is for particular purposes. But technologies are never exactly for the things that they're supposed to be for. Or what they are for turns out never to be fully definable in advance. As the word telephone, meaning far speaker, might suggest, the first telephones were conceived of principally as ways of conveying messages or transmitting orders. Queen Victoria installed one in 1876 in her residence on the Isle of Wight, and the earliest adopters also included mines and police stations. Everyone knew in principle already that telephones allowed the person you called to answer back. But users, it seems, have to discover for themselves what telephone conversations might actually be like. We can understand technological instruments by thinking of musical instruments, which are, of course, for making music. But exactly what is meant by the words making and music are just what musical instruments are designed to fill out. Technologies are invented in order to perform certain specified tasks, but they're also therefore tools of invention, including the invention of themselves and their own purposes. When Nokia added the capacity to send short text messages to their new phone in the 1980s, nobody really thought there would be much use for it. Technologies are, in fact, playthings just as much as working tools, machines for working out what can be done with them and done with ourselves through our use of them. I hope it's become clear that whether or not we respond to it, technology always poses a kind of question, in that it always requires, and in fact always implicitly is, a way of thinking about itself. And thinking about technology must always involve thinking about a great many other things apart from technology, which are also really a part of it. Work, play, time, meaning, purpose, just as the only route to a full understanding of the present is via the past, so a purely technical understanding of technology is bound to overlook what is most important, and even more important than its importance, what is most interesting about it. Technology is a kind of language, even a kind of theatre, in which we act out and communicate the kinds of being we aim to make of ourselves. How well we do that work of collective self-imagining is never a mere matter of fact. It is how we strive and contrive to do things that matter better.